Okay, it looks like we're we're live. Okay, um, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for for joining today's lecture. Um, my name is James Brown, and I am a senior lecturer in computer science at the University of Lincoln. And for the next oh, forty-five minutes or so, if we're lucky, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about artificial intelligence, uh, or AI as it's otherwise known, and uh, a little bit about some of the applications of AI in medicine that have taken place over the last few years and hopefully give you some some reasons to be interested and excited for the future. Um, so without further ado, I think uh, we can crack on with bringing these slides up. Um, and if they could be blown up to be the largest, yeah, that's perfect. All right, thank you very much. Okay, let's go. So whenever I prepare a talk, um, one of the first things I do is, as I'm sure many people do, is go to Google and do a bit of a Google image search. Uh, and uh, in my case, I searched for artificial intelligence. Um, and I, I'm showing you these images, really, because I want to define AI by, first of all, telling you what it isn't. And um, I think these pictures sort of exemplify that a little bit. Um, what you tend to see are, are some patterns here. So these are all images returned by Google when you search for AI, and you, you see lots of brains, um, which kind of makes sense. Lots of digital looking brains, lots of circuitry. Um, you see quite a few robots as well, as you might expect. And, you know, I think it's it's fairly safe to say this is a somewhat glamorized version of events, uh, but nevertheless cool. Um, but um, what I want to do actually is, is talk about um, a somewhat different uh, kind of view of AI. And I, I think it's best, it's a distinction best made like this. So. Here's two images. On the left-hand side is, I suppose, the, the Hollywood um, interpretation of, of AI. So you see a, a futuristic robot that looks like a robot from, from a certain Will Smith movie uh, interacting with a touchscreen device of sorts, uh, some sort of future, futuristic glassy display. Um, and it's, it's fun and it's, it's interesting and uh, I'm sure it makes for a good movie, but it's, it's not very accurate. Um, and, uh, you know, first of all, why is a robot interacting with a computer? It's, it is a computer. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are, there are other reasons why it's, it's a little bit of an odd picture. Uh, and on, but on the other extreme uh, is, is the image on the right-hand side. So this is, um, this is a screenshot of my, uh, my terminal um, with a few lines of code. And this happens to be Python code um, written in the Python programming language. And this, too, is AI. This is a piece of code that load some data, uh, it creates a, a model of sorts, it trains that model, and then it runs that model. Um, and so while this is a little bit of a, a trivial uh, example, um, this is more the kind of AI that I'm going to be talking about. It's it's software, um, and it um, doesn't have quite the same level of, of, of drama associated with it. But nevertheless, I hope it's something that you'll find interesting as we, as we proceed. Um, and yes, please do ask questions along the way, and I shall try my best to, to answer them as we go. Um, so I think the, the real distinction between those two images is actually this. It's uh, the difference between AI, so artificial intelligence, and something called artificial general intelligence. Now, as the name suggests, AGI is more referencing a form of intelligence which is, is general. It is um, able to solve many human tasks, or in principle, any human task, and learn any human task. Um, and this is very often the sort of artificial intelligence you see in the movies, is, is AGI. It's worth stressing at this point that this form of AI is, is hypothetical. It is not forthcoming, particularly. Um, there are probably some that would argue we've made progress in the last few years towards AGI. Um, but it, we're not there yet. Um, what we're talking about today is going to be a form of AI which generally is focusing on one particular task at a time. We're not concerned with solving lots of tasks simultaneously most of the time. And it is real. AI is real and it is improving all the time. Um, it is less commonly featured in science fiction, mainly because it perhaps doesn't make for as exciting a movie. Um, but it is nevertheless uh, interesting, or at least I think so. And um, but both are active, actively researched. So I think there's something like 40 different companies that are researching AGI, and that's where where it's their focus. But I think it's safe to say AI is an active research topic in basically every computer science and informatics department um, anywhere in the world. So it's it's generally a much bigger area of research at the moment. 
I can't, um, you know, proceed towards um, the specific areas that I'm interested in and what I'll be talking about today without touching on what AI uh, is more broadly. Um, there's a lot to it. Um, and if you've tuned into any of the talks that have taken place already this week, and I highly suggest you you go back and watch um, as many as you can if you miss them, um, you'll know that AI has multi multiple facets. So an example would be something like planning. Um, now, as human beings, we do planning all the time. Um, you plan by deciding what you're going to wear each day. You're going, you plan by deciding whether or not to take an umbrella with you when you go outside or what you plan to eat for dinner in the evening. And all of these things, if you were to write down all of the things you plan to do in a day, you would realize just how complicated it is. And so trying to actually develop intelligent systems that can plan is, is an incredible uh, technical challenge. And, um, there is more to this set of, of research topics. Uh, they are all related to one another in some way or another, um, and they're all interesting. However, today I'm gonna to be focusing really on two of these areas of AI. The first, which is perception. Um, so here I'm referring to trying to develop techniques, so algorithms and, and software that can perceive the world in which we live. So. Usually this informs some kind of sensor, like a camera or, or something like that, um, and taking images from uh, a camera or a video recorder and doing something with them to try and understand the world. And the other aspect of what I'll be talking about is learning. So specifically trying to develop these machines that start off bad at a task and gradually become good at that task over time, rather than trying to write the software and make it intelligent from the start, um, which is, is generally quite tricky to do. So really learning is, is sort of a means to an end. Um, and we tend generally refer, refer to uh, learning in the context of AI as machine learning. Um, and this is kind of a, a kind of rough schematic and breakdown of, of the different layers within uh, AI and machine learning. Now, machine learning, as I said, is, um, is all about improving through experience, so developing tools and software that start bad and end up good. Um, but within machine learning, we have a whole series of different approaches. And there's many, many methods that I'm not going to talk about today uh, that I, I would love to talk about. But I'm only going to focus on uh, on a small subset of, of um, machine learning, which is uh, within brain inspired methods. So these are machine learning techniques which are loosely inspired by how human brains learn um, and specifically using something called an artificial neural network. So as the name suggests, it is a model of the sorts of neural networks that exist within our own brains. Now, they don't work in the same way. They certainly don't learn quite in the same way, but they are inspired by um, the, the physical, uh, biological neural networks in our own brains. I'm actually gonna go slightly deeper than that um, and uh, because the history of AI research goes, stretches way back uh, to the the 50s, arguably. Um, and I'm going to talk about something called deep learning, which some of you may well have heard of in, in the news. Um, and it's really where all the hype is at the moment. And it's where I think a lot of the excitement has come from here about AI over the past few years. Um, and I'm going to hopefully try and tour you through some of the more uh, interesting applications of deep learning in uh, in medicine. But, but before I do that, I want to talk about um, a more general problem to try and give you an idea of how these sorts of methods work. So let's imagine for a second that we want to produce a system, a piece of software that can tell you whether the image that you're giving it is a cat or a dog. Sounds a bit trivial, but it's uh, nevertheless quite a difficult task for a computer to do. So let's imagine that our algorithm, um, this is just an analogy here, um, but let's imagine that it is a, a black box um, with a slot on the left-hand side, and we simply insert our, our picture into the slot. It gets converted into a digital signal, um, and then it is fed through some, uh, some, some wires um, that are wired in some way, and they eventually connect up with the light bulbs at the end. And ultimately, what we want this box to be able to do is to turn on the cat bulb when we give it a picture of a cat, and the dog bulb when you give it a picture of a dog. Now, what we're the, the 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 way we're thinking about this is that we want to make this box not only work for these two images, we want to work make it work in the general case. 
So I don't want this box to learn what my dog looks like. I want it to look, learn a general idea of what dogs look like and equally the same for cats. And the way we want to do that is to configure these dials in some way. So you can see these five little knobs on the side of the box. And we want to find some configuration of those dials that makes the right light bulb turn on for the right image. Now, this is a really difficult problem. If we only had five dials and we had just these two images, say, we might, by a bit of trial and error, figure out a dial position that works. Um, however, if we want to work, make this work for the general case, for any for picture of any dog or a picture of any cat, we need many, many more dials than this. And at that point, it becomes completely infeasible for a human to just twiddle the knobs. So what we do instead is we use something called a learning algorithm. Um, and there are many different learning algorithms, but um, at least within deep learning, there is, there's really one, and it's been around for a long time. And it involves a slightly different configuration of our box. So first of all, what we do is, as before, we take our picture um, and we feed it into the black box. Um, and whatever the dial positions are at this point, we might initialize them randomly. We just say, well, whatever, let's just go with it. We get some answer. It may be right, it may be wrong. But what we do is we compare that with the truth. And so for every image that we feed our black box, we also give it the correct answer. So we say, this is a dog. So in a, in a sense, we are supervising the model. We are training the model. And this is why it is called supervised learning. Our error calculator um, will measure the difference between what the, the box has predicted and what the truth is. And it will learn how to tweak those dials accordingly so it is better next time. It won't be perfect. It's a gradual process. It takes lots and lots of tries. But given enough time and enough data, um, and maybe a little bit of luck, uh, you'll end up with a model that works. And that is really the foundation of, of deep learning and this particular class of techniques that I'm going to talk about. So what about harder problems? So the dog-cat example is, is a relatively trivial one um, and not necessarily that useful in practice. But what about a data set like this? Um, so this is a data set called ImageNet. This is just a, a subset of the images within the database, but there are millions of them. And each image has a label and there's a thousand possible labels. So these are, there are a range of objects in there. These are only small, but it covers everything from household items to vehicles, animals, um, buildings, you name it, it's in there. So how do we build a box that does this? How do we develop an algorithm? How do we train a machine to, to recognize images like these? Well, this is actually uh, an annual competition. Uh, so the ImageNet competition runs each year. Um, and this is the uh, a bar chart. So it's showing the last five years of this algorithm, uh, sorry, of this, uh, of this competition. And each year, the uh, winning algorithm is, is uh, announced and the error rate is um, is shown as a percentage here. So you can see each year the, the winning algorithm has some error. Uh, in 2011, the winning algorithm for this competition had an error rate of 26%. So, you know, not bad. 74% of images were correctly, uh, correctly classified. But we're still some way off human performance at this point, right? So human performance, so if you ask a human to uh, label these images themselves, they too have an error rate of about 5%. We're, we're not infallible, humans make mistakes too. So um, really that's our, our benchmark, right? That's where we want to get to. And for several years building up to 2011, it was, there was success and it was, there was a downward trend, but in 2012, something pretty remarkable happened. We saw a big jump in the performance in this competition. We saw in 2012, the winning model got an error rate of around about 16%. And what was, I think, more remarkable than anything is that the method, the actual underlying technique is very much like the one I just described with the, the black box idea, except it was somewhat modeled on a technique that was published in the 90s. So what changed? What has taken place in that time that has, has allowed us to go from a relatively uh, high error rate to this much lower error rate? And the answer comes down to the dials, um, the number of dials on the side of this box. And there, there are other factors as well, um, but this is a, a key one. The model in the 90s that this was modeled on had 60,000 dials, so way above what a human could manually tweak. 
But the 2012 model had 60 million dials. So a massive number of parameters um, is, is the, the technical term we would use. Um, and ever since then, every single submission has been based to some degree on that same idea using this, um, this type of deep learning approach. Um, and we saw this gradual decrease in error. And then 2015 was really where things got a bit wacky. And we actually saw human performance uh, was, was reached. In fact, it was exceeded. So in 2015, the winning model beat humans for the first time in this competition. So that has brought about a, a lot of uh, changes um, in, in the world. And deep learning is now everywhere. Um, this is only a few examples of, of where deep learning is applied, but um, there are more. Uh, Self-driving cars is probably one of the most uh, exciting, I think. Um, so deep learning is used in, in the computers uh, within uh, self-driving vehicles. Uh, it takes visual images. So you have cameras that are on the side of the car um, and analyzes those images and detects the locations of pedestrians, cyclists, buildings, other vehicles, the road, and so on, and allows these cars to navigate the world. Um, I kept perhaps a more frivolous um, but uh, but fun application of deep learning is in something called style transfer. So this is uh, the idea where rather than having a, a box which takes an image in and spits out a single answer, it actually spits out a second image. So you can imagine there's a slot at the other end. And in this case, you can see an image where um, it, uh, it's been a black and white image was input and a colorized version was output, um, or at least a, an estimate of what the color image might have looked like, which is, which is really cool. And I, I, I welcome you to to do a bit of searching of your own to see some nice examples of this. But um, the uh, the area that I'm most interested in is, is this example on the right-hand side, which is computer-aided diagnosis. So this is uh, where we try to develop uh, artificial intelligence um, methods that can analyze medical images. So examples here being ultrasound um, on the top left-hand side, uh, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, um, I'm sure maybe you've heard of MRI scans, even if you've never had one, um, maybe from a medical drama or two, um, x-rays as well, um, and also things like retinal uh, images, which I am going to talk about now. So this is an example of one particular disease, um, which has been um, a, a focus area um, in recent years. So uh, on the left-hand side here, you can see a fundus camera. So this is a camera that um, is specialized for taking pictures of the back of the eye. Some of you may well have had a retinal photograph taken at some point or another at the opticians. Um, and while it can be used in part to check your general um, general eye health, um, it is uh, important in particular for uh, people with diabetes. So um, one of the complications of diabetes is a disease known as diabetic retinopathy. Um, it is a leading cause of blindness um, in, in developed countries and is, um, is a major public health problem. Around about 4 million people in the UK have diabetes and around about a third of those will develop some form of diabetic retinopathy in their lifetime. And so it's really important to be able to diagnose this, this, uh, this disease as early as possible in order to, um, to treat patients um, in a timely manner um, and try and prevent any, any visual loss from occurring. And you can see visually here sort of the, the, the differences, some of the visual differences between a normal retina, which is the, the, this layer at the back of the eye, and a diabetic uh, retina. So what are the challenges? And what are the challenges that AI might help us uh, to solve here? So, I mean, the first of them is, is subjectivity. And this doesn't just affect uh, diabetic retinopathy. It, it's relevant to pretty much any disease where there's no um, sort of diagnostic test, which is um, you know a, a gold standard. Um, when it is based on a on a subjective analysis of the patient by by the doctor, there is going to be some variation, um, and ultimately that variation between different doctors could have an effect on the diagnosis, which could affect the treatment and could affect the outcome. Another one is we may not necessarily have access to uh, healthcare. In all, in all parts of the world. There are um, remote areas of, of many countries which do not have um, immediate access to, to healthcare or 
access to clinicians with the relevant expertise to diagnose a condition. And so it's really important to try and help um, help patients in these regions have access to the best quality healthcare and ensure that their um, that whatever condition it is is being diagnosed um, as quickly as possible. Another key one is the quality of the images themselves that can have an impact on on the ability to diagnose um, disease reliably. So all of these challenges are something that I think, um, to some degree, computer aided computer aided diagnosis tries to tries to address, and where AI has proven to be really su successful uh, in in recent years. So AI um, has been applied and developed for for diabetic retinopathy. Um, Three years ago, there was a, um, a really great paper uh, published by a team at Google Health, which involved trying to train one of these uh, one of these models, um, this this black box idea um, that I presented. And to do this, they trained it with uh, over a hundred thousand images, which were a mix of uh, healthy retinas and diseased retinas. They used a model um, that had about five million dials um, to, to tweak, uh, and they attempted to classify the images as being either healthy or diseased. And what they showed is that it was indeed possible, first of all, so they achieved a 98% sensitivity. So what this means is that 98% of patients that had diabetic retinopathy were correctly diagnosed as having it, and it had a 94% specificity. So in other words, 6% of patients that were healthy were um, misdiagnosed as having diabetic retinopathy. Now it's hard to appreciate those numbers without a bit of context. So for the key thing that this paper shown is, is that if you compare the output of the model, this, this, um, this machine learning approach to clinicians is that they compare very favorably with one another. In fact, it exceeded the performance of some clinicians. Um, it did not perform as well as some others, but on average it was as good as as um, as a human clinician at diagnosing diabetic retinopathy, and this was a first. It was a real milestone, and it has spawned a whole host of other uh, other research in this disease and also uh, various others as well. So, interesting. I'm going in the wrong direction. There we go. So, how has AI helped here, really? So, in addition to actually offering performance that's comparable with clinicians, it's now impartial. So while there can be biases that end up being in, in, uh, sorry, in, incorporated into the model, it will always give you the same answer. And it's not emotional. It's not something that is going to respond to, to pressure. It's not going to give you a different answer at a different time of day. Um, it is a model that will always give you the same answer given the same image. Another really useful aspect of this is that it can be done remotely. So um, it is possible to send images from potentially remote locations where a doctor can't get to, to somewhere where the machine is able to actually analyze the image and send the result back over the internet. Uh, and so this is called telemedicine and there's a number of pilot programs going on at the moment to facilitate this. Another aspect is that um, the quality issue can be somewhat mitigated by uh, developing a system that can actually do some kind of quality control as well. So the researchers who worked on this paper have have um, have attempted to validate this method in in um, in remote areas and it added some quality control um, elements to it as well to ensure that any poor quality images were rejected prior to uh, analysis by the method. So it really is powerful. It's exciting and it's uh, there's there's uh, a lot of promise in in, in the future. I can't not touch on a bit more of the detail of how this approach worked because it is kind of crazy. Um, so I mentioned that they used a model with 5 million, uh, 5 million dials or, or parameters. But interestingly, they, they actually used a model which was, um, you, or it was submitted to the ImageNet competition, that very competition I mentioned a couple of slides ago, um, because this is what we tend to do nowadays. It's a bit of a strange thing, but what we're quite lazy, us, us computer scientists, is we say, well, if that box worked for somebody else for a different problem, it will probably work for mine as well. So they started with the same box, essentially, but not only did they take the same box, they even trained it first on the ImageNet data set. And they did that to learn the initial dial positions. So rather than setting the dials at random and then just training straight away with the retinal images, they pre-trained 
the uh, box with the ImageNet database. And then they fine-tuned it on the retinal images, and then they did their evaluation and got the answers. And what they, what they showed is that the model would perform better if it was pre-trained on ImageNet than if you started from scratch, which even now, I mean, I, this is now mainstream. Uh, most people who are working in this area will do something like this. It, it's still bonkers to me uh, that it works. I'm going to try and explain why this works. Um, and it comes down to actually the way these models are structured. So what I haven't really said at this point is that you can think about the images as undergoing a sort of sequence of operations. So they undergo uh, a kind of filtering. Um, so each time the image steps through past one of these dials, it is filtered in some way. And it's filtered in the same sense as uh, images on Instagram filtered. Um, it undergoes a change which highlights certain features and suppresses others. And in the early regions of the network, so near to where the image is fed in, the, the box is responsible for detecting kind of low level features. So edges and corners and basic textures and things like that. And these tend to be universal. These are not unique to one particular class of images. So they're not unique to the ImageNet database. They're not unique to retinas. They're not unique to any other kind of medical image. They are highly general. So this is why this pre-training helps because ImageNet is that much bigger that you can build a much more powerful model than if you just started training the model from, from scratch using your retinal images. On the right hand side is where things start to get a bit weird. So nearer to the output is where the features start to take on a really odd appearance. And you can actually start to see these features popping such as eyes you can see in there. If you look closely, you can see um, ears if you squint. And there's a larger set of filters here that I haven't shown that include things like noses and limbs and all sorts and it's really weird. And that stuff is not relevant to retinas. But what happens during the training is these filters get suppressed. They, they disappear and they learn features that are more directly relevant to the, to the retina. So that's, that's a kind of at least a, a brief overview of why that approach works. Um, so I've done a bit of work in, in, in retina myself, albeit for a different disease. Um, I've worked um, a, uh, on a, a disease called retinopathy of prematurity or, or ROP for short. Um, unlike Diabetic retinopathy, this is a disease that affects um, uh, babies born prematurely. Um, so the, the reason that this happens is that um, babies born prematurely have not got fully mature retinas. So the blood vessels in the, in the back of the eye of the retina that provide oxygen to the tissues in the retina, they continue to develop all the way to the end of gestation. If a baby's born prematurely, that process is interrupted, the vessels don't grow properly, and it can lead to severe complications. In the most extreme case, it can lead to blindness. Thankfully, nowadays, we have some really great treatments. And so one of the key things is being able to ensure that treatment is administered in a timely manner. And what we did is we developed a, uh, a deep learning approach that could not only diagnose this condition, but also track the disease severity through time. So on the uh, left-hand side of this, um, of this slide, you can see a graph where you can see weeks along the bottom. Um, in the middle is the point where the, a particular baby or a, a number of babies were treated. On the left-hand side uh, is the weeks building up to providing the treatment, and the weeks that followed is post-treatment. And on the vertical axis is the severity that has been measured by the algorithm. So this is an automatic score that is calculated by this machine learning model. And what you can see is the model is able to measure the disease trending upwards in all of these babies, but then also measure the disease severity trending downwards after the treatment has been administered. And that has been um, has, was, a, was a really exciting finding and could potentially be used to try and do some form of treatment monitoring in babies uh, in the future. Um, I also um, am very grateful to work with um, some other researchers here at Lincoln who also work in, in retina, um, in this case for quite a lot longer than me. Um, so uh, Bashir Aldiri, who gave a talk earlier on this week, has been working with um, retina images for a number of years. His focus is, um, has been primarily on measuring uh, the vessels themselves. So he has also done some work in retinopathy of prematurity, but he's also done some work in diabetic retinopathy. 
And unlike the methods I described earlier, which try to just take the whole image and just tell you what's wrong with it, so is it healthy or diseased, he's worked on some methods that also use deep learning to detect specific markers of disease. So it can detect where these tiny uh, micro aneurysms have, um, have occurred in the retina. Um, and what's particularly uh, powerful about this work is it, was been, it has been validated on three different data sets. So rather than just having data from a single institution, this method has been demonstrated to work on, on, on several different data sets. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about that actually um, at the end of this uh, presentation. But for now, I'm gonna change, uh, change topic slightly and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, brain tumors. Um, so what you can see here are two um, magnetic resonance images or MRI scans. Um, on the left is a, an MRI scanner, which um, is, if you've never had one, uh, basically a giant magnet. It's very, very loud and it measures the, um, the distribution of uh, water inside the human body. So it shows you the density of certain tissues and it's a particularly useful technique for imaging the brain. Um, and so uh, brain tumors uh, are a really important area of, of, of interest for, for me personally in that uh, there are lots of diagnostic challenges uh, associated with it. So on the left hand side, you can see a healthy brain. Um, this is a, a, an MRI scan of a brain. And on the right hand side is a patient with uh, a glioma which is a particular type of brain tumor. Thankfully, it is rare, but it is the, this is the most common kind of, of, uh, of brain tumor. And one of the key challenges here is we can all see it. I mean, most of us could probably see there is a tumor present in this image on the right hand side, but it is not necessarily obvious where the tumor starts and stops. Um, it is an open problem, it is knowing where the healthy tissue stops and the cancerous tissue starts because ultimately the way in which this is treated could be a combination. So uh, chemotherapy is common um, where we're just administering a drug which goes through the whole body, but radiotherapy is another way in which gliomas are treated. And so we need to target that tumor very precisely, but also surgery. So in a, in a surgical setting, we need to make sure we get all of the tumor and leave none of it behind and minimize the damage to healthy tissue. So again, this presents a really big technical challenge. Um, and so I want to introduce uh, another competition that happens. So like the ImageNet competition, there is another called the BRATS challenge, which takes place again every year. And this time the goal is not to classify images, but to actually essentially paint them. It is to determine the boundaries of uh, of this particular type of tumor, a glioma. And not only that, we don't just want to determine the region of the whole tumor, but all of these sub compartments because gliomas, it turns out, are very complicated. They have different regions that have different behaviors. You have regions of fluid. We have bits of the tumor that are active and alive. We have uh, regions of the tumor that are dead and um, inactive. And so being able to actually accurately mark where these locations are is really important for, for diagnosis and treatment. And again, AI has proven to be a really powerful approach for doing this. So I was involved in some work actually before I was at Lincoln um, on trying to do just this, and it involved training a few boxes rather than just one. So we trained a, a box for doing image segmentation. So it takes an image in, and produces an image on the other end. And first of all, it produces a segmentation. So uh, it draws a boundary around the whole tumor, but that information is then fed into a second box, which annotates the other compartments of the tumor. We found that worked, um, uh, worked a bit better than if you just had a single box. And um, we participated in the competition. Uh, we didn't win, but we did okay. I think we were around about mid table. Little did I know, my future colleagues um, at Lincoln were also competing in this competition. I don't think I've ever checked to see which of us came out on top, but maybe I won't um, for my own sanity. Um, but uh, they developed a, 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 an approach which was quite different. It still uses um, machine learning, um, but what they do is they take the images of these, these MRI scans, they break up the image into these larger components, which are called super pixels. And each of those super pixels is then classified based on the 
uh, content of those of those superpixels. So they examine inside each one and determine whether or not it belongs to the tumor or belongs to healthy tissue. And it works and produces these lovely images. And as I say, I don't know which of us came out on top, um, but uh, may maybe I will find out at some point. Okay, so um, I mean, I'm obsessed with imaging, I, I love it, but I, I, it would be remiss of me not to talk about some non-imaging applications of AI in medicine. Um, and this one is pretty much hot off the press um, and it involves a little bit of, of explanation before I dive in. So I'm gonna talk a bit about proteins now. Um, so as you all know, um, DNA is probably one of the most important uh, bits of biology that we, we know about uh, in that it is responsible for the, it is the blueprint for life, if you will. So it, it, it is responsible for producing the proteins that circulate through our body and carry out all sorts of tasks. The process from going from DNA to protein is actually quite complicated, a lot more complicated than how I'm depicting it, but for the, for the sake of uh, uh, a short talk, um, this, this gives you an overview. So we start off with our, our DNA, which gets unwrapped, and it gets translated into uh, a protein. But first of all, it is in an unfolded state. So what happens is that the sequence is made up of these building blocks, which are called amino acids. So each protein is just simply a sequence of these amino acids. There are 20 different ones, and the exact um, behavior of the protein depends on that sequence. Depending on the sequence, you get a different shape. So every protein has a unique shape and it is governed by that sequence of amino acids. Once it becomes folded, it determines how that protein ultimately goes to function in the body and behave in a particular way. And while it's, um, it's very important to understand the, how these proteins are folded and what, what shape they take, it's actually something that's very difficult to do. Um, around about 90% of all the proteins we know about um, for, ver for various um, um, you know, functions in the body have been determined this way. So it uses a technique called X-ray crystallography, um, which involves taking our protein of interest. We don't know what it looks like at this point. We, we produce a crystallized version of it. We bombard it with X-rays. Those X-rays diffract, so they interact with the atoms and the electrons inside our protein crystals. You get this beautiful pattern and from that pattern using some clever mathematical techniques you can actually reconstruct the 3d structure and knowing that 3d structure is really useful for understanding biology however it's it's an imperfect process for a number of reasons first of all it takes a long time it takes a long time to do this and there's a whole lot of um of legwork involved to to do this it's also very expensive to do um so you know in order to actually understand um, what a protein is shaped like, you probably need to invest many, many thousands of, of pounds in order to do it. Um, but also it's not a perfect system. It's not entirely reliable. Um, when you have proteins that are crystals, they don't necessarily uh, stay folded the way they were. And so there's been a lot of research into doing this in different ways. Um, and there are computational approaches. So this a computational approach involves, first of all, taking this sequence that we get. So this is the sequence that is produced by our DNA. You get a chain of amino acids. And what we want to know is how does this end up being folded? Because the process of it being folded happens sort of spontaneously, and it depends on the positions of these amino acids and how they bind to one another. Now, this seems like a good candidate for deep learning. Um, and in, it turns out it is. Um, but what's worth noting here is that there are many, many possibilities that need to be explored. Now, they aren't explored exhaustively. They aren't all tried. But just to give you an idea, a, a typical protein could have 10 to the 300 possible different ways of folding. So that's 10 times 10 times 10, 300 times. That's how many possible ways in which a protein can be folded. For what it's worth, the number of particles in the universe is about 10 to the power of 80. So we're way above a number that could actually be imagined, but I couldn't even write it out. It wouldn't even fit inside the universe. So it's a huge problem. And it's a problem that's been around for about 50 years. And there has 
again, been an annual challenge associated with, with this. And it is called the CASP challenge. And the CASP challenge tries to figure out, or um, the competitors try to figure out, how proteins fold given some sequence. So each competitor is given a, a set of 100 proteins, and they have to produce a model. Uh, a, it could be a machine learning module, model, it doesn't have to be, and figure out what the structure is. And over the last few years, as again, this graph shows here, similar to the ImageNet graph, you have um, a fairly flat um, performance over, over time. Um, you don't need to worry about what the actual numbers mean here, but all you, can, all you need to know is, in this case, the higher the number, the better. And in 2018, uh, there was a team at DeepMind, which is a London-based AI company. They developed a technique called AlphaFold, which is based on, on deep learning, which could predict the structure or the shape of a protein with much, much higher accuracy than the models that came before. But this year, something really remarkable happened, is that uh, the second version of this software achieved an almost 90% performance for this. Now, the implications for this weren't obvious to me at first read because I'm not a protein person. I, I don't do protein folding for a living, but it's worth recognizing here that 90% is around about the performance of X-ray crystallography. So if you do this, if you try to figure out the shape of a protein via experiments, that's around the accuracy that you'll get on any given experiment. And this computational method achieves the same performance. And on the left-hand side here, you can see two structures that are overlapping. So the red structure, I believe, is the one predicted by the model, and the blue one is the one that was the truth. And you can see visibly that they, they're almost perfectly overlapping. Now, the implications of this really can't be understated. Why is this important? Well, it's really important for drug design. So most drugs that are designed for a variety of diseases, very often they have to interact with a protein at some point. And so being able to know the shape of a protein means we can design a drug um, that binds to it and hopefully suppresses whatever disease it is we're targeting. And if we can do that in a much shorter time frame with the same accuracy, then we are able in principle to design drugs much quicker. And it's worth noting that these algorithms, these deep learning algorithms, are very fast. If you have a uh, uh, if you have the hardware, which is, is now readily available and getting cheaper all the time, it is really, really quick to uh, generate, um, in principle, a structure like this using the uh, sequence um, as the input. Also, just generally speaking, understanding how proteins work and understanding their shape is essential to understanding the disease itself. Um, you can see on the right here, you may recognize this particular um, diagram. This is SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes um, COVID-19, the, the um, which is the, the current uh, disease of the day, as I'm sure you're aware. And uh, the vaccines that we, um, I say we, I cannot I take any responsibility, that some wonderful scientists have been, have been producing um, are based on not a knowledge of how these proteins are structured. And so being able to understand the shape of a protein more quickly is only going to make the ability to discover new drugs and new treatments quicker and cheaper, which has to be a good thing. Uh, another more uh, recent and relevant um, application of AI in medicine is is in COVID itself. So uh, some scientists have developed a smartphone-based application which can classify COVID-19 based on your cough. So they developed this, this method by taking sound recordings of uh, a, a variety of, of people, some of whom had COVID, some of whom did not have COVID and may have had other conditions or were otherwise healthy. And trained a machine learning approach very similar to the ones I've shown you already. In fact, it's, it's, I think this one was based on the 2015 ImageNet <laughs> competition winner. Um, they trained this uh, model to classify coughs um, as being uh, caused by COVID or by other conditions. Um, and they got remarkable performance. They got 98.5% uh, uh, sensitivity and 94% uh, specificity. So 
really high performance, not as good necessarily as a diagnostic test, but for a, a test that one could in principle administer at home, um, it's a really, really exciting development and I'm, I'm keen to see where it goes. I've kind of talked about everything in a very positive light so far. Um, uh, and I think it is exciting. And I think the applications of AI are um, by and large going to have a positive um, impact in the future. But I think it is worth highlighting some, some things to be a bit uh, cautious about. Um, and there's three things I've picked out here. Uh, there are others, um, but I'm going to talk about these three. And I'm going to start off with um, this idea of domain shift. Domain shift is a technical term, but it's actually quite simple um, in practice. So let's say uh, I work at Hospital A, which is based in, in the UK, or, or I, I am collaborating with Hospital A in the UK, and they have asked me, can you develop a machine learning algorithm that can diagnose this retinal disease? Um, it doesn't matter what it is. And I say, sure, how much data have you got? And they say, oh, we've got tons, and it's all annotated, and I go, fantastic, send it over. And um, we write some agreements, and we go through the legality of all of that, and uh, we make sure everything is above board, and there's um, uh, appropriate informed consent in place, and we train uh, a, an artificial intelligence model, and we get some results, and it's very exciting, and uh, we publish the paper, and they say, fantastic, thank you very much. And then we get a call from our colleagues in America who say, would you mind trying out your model on our images? And I say, sure, let's do that. So they send over the, the images and I run it and suddenly I find the performance is much, much lower. This is domain shift. This is where our model has been trained on a subset of the full population of images that exist in the world. And there's a whole series of factors that, that could go into this. Um, first of all, different um, demographics, so different patients, different ethnicities, different distribution of gender. Um, there's a whole host of factors which could make the data in the UK different from the data in the US. There's also the instruments themselves. We have different cameras. Different cameras may produce slightly different images and may emphasize some things more than others. Maybe some more of the vessels are showing. Maybe the optic disc looks different. There's a whole series of things that could affect this. And these things may not be understood by the model, depending on how we've trained it. There are other factors as well. There's how the data itself was annotated. There are many, many things. So it, it's, it's a really important thing to understand is that it is not necessarily the case that these models will just work when you let them go into the wild. And a number of people have discovered this the hard way. And so there's a lot of work to try and ensure that, first of all, international collaboration is, is, um, is essential to developing these models, but also ensuring that when we train these models, we understand the implications uh, when, when they don't work. Another big one is explainability. So I wrote black box on the side of the uh, box for, for a reason in, in that it's very, very difficult with these machine learning models to know what's going on inside. Uh, all we know is where the dial positions are and what the output is um, really in, in practice. And so actually understanding why a particular image has been classified in a particular way is very, very difficult. And it becomes particularly troubling when an image is say, input into our box here and it get, gives us an unexpected result. So here I've put in a healthy image and I'm seeing diseased uh, flagged up. Um, the, light, the diseased light bulb has, has turned on and I consult with my clinician colleagues and they say, mm -hmm, I, don't, I, I don't trust that at all. That looks healthy to me. And so I ask, why, why? Um, why, why is this model doing this? And it is a very, very difficult question to answer. And it is an open problem in trying to peer open this black box and understand exactly what's going on under the hood. I think this one's quite amusing, um, but also important. Um, it's something called an adversarial attack. So this is uh, something that is, is fairly specific to this class of, of techniques I've been talking about. But what I'm gonna show you here is a quick video. Um, so. On the uh, left here, you can see a picture of banana. And on the right hand side is a, uh, a little chart showing all the possible things it could be that the model is guessing. And the height of this bar corresponds to the confidence. So right now, the model is saying, with high probability, this is a banana. And as the video progresses, it shakes around a little bit. But even when they put a picture of a toaster down, it is still fairly convinced that what it's looking at is a banana. Um, so you can see that there's a, some probability that the image could be a toaster, but really I know you, you, you've shown me a picture of a banana here. 
But these researchers showed it is possible to fool these models with a very specially engineered sticker. Um, this, was, this was called an adversarial patch. And I will just briefly go back to the, the, the key section here, is when they put this sticker down, the model becomes utterly convinced it is looking at a toaster. That is not a picture of a toaster. It is a cleverly engineered adversarial example that's being shown here. Now, that might be a, not of any real concern uh, for, for this particular problem, but it may be a concern for medicine. So some, some researchers uh, elsewhere have applied the same concept to medical images. They have produced adversarial example images. Here is a, is a photograph of a skin lesion. But rather than putting a sticker on it, which is really obvious, they've done something really sneaky, which is to create something called adversarial noise. And this is basically invisible changes to the image, which are designed specifically to fool a particular model. So in this case, they've taken an image of a benign skin lesion. They've added this adversarial noise. This is the outcome, which is an image that looks exactly the same, at least to the human eye. And that has fooled the machine in saying, into say, thinking it's malignant. So obviously this has huge implications um, and is something that should be, if only to understand that these, these machines are not perfect and they can be tricked in these very, very unusual ways. Okay, so where do we stand now? So we're, as I say, about eight or so years into this uh, kind of remarkable period in the history of AI. And it is, I think, absolutely accurate to say that we have seen huge advances. We, the progress has been rapid. More and more people have, have, have started work in this area and we're seeing amazing results happening. But it, there are still challenges. And obviously I've highlighted some of those. There are others as well, but it's important to be aware that these systems are not perfect and they need to be carefully engineered and understood when deployed in clinical settings. And for that reason, humans are always needed. I always say that machines have an appalling bedside manner. Um, doctors are not just diagnosticians. They are clinicians. They handle all facets of, uh, of, of, of patients and, um, and healthcare. And so it's important to understand that this is just one part of the pipeline. Being able to provide AI as a tool um, is something that... Um, I think it's just like any other tool that we could be providing to, to, our, to our healthcare workers. I've seen a question pop up, which is, is a good one. Do I consider poor interpretability as a major limitation for the deep learning approach? Um, I do, I do see it as, as a limitation. I think any efforts to try and uh, peer open, peer into the, into the black box are only going to be beneficial. One thing I would add, and this is based on personal experience, um, I've worked, I've been very lucky to work with some fantastic clinicians in, in, over the years. And um, one thing we found very early on is um, doctors aren't very interpretable either. Uh, and when you ask um, doctors what they think, why they think a particular image is the way it is. So you could say, can you tell me why that particular image looks this way? And why, why is this diagnosed as severe? They use some really unusual language. They, I, I, one of the terms we hear a lot is angry. I say, yeah, that just looks a bit angry to me. Um, and so it's worth having that um, in mind when we talk about interpretability is that while obviously we need some safeguards in place to make sure we know what these machines are doing, it is difficult even for doctors to explain themselves and, and, and state why a particular diagnosis is what it is. But that's a fantastic question. Um, so as I say, I think AI is just another tool and I think that's how we need to treat it. It is something that is complementary to the to existing clinical workflows. It's going to take time, it's going to take training, and clinicians need to be kept in the loop. When we are, as, as engineers, we very often get very bogged down in performance and making models that are that work, but not necessarily models that are useful. And so keeping clinicians in the loop is, is essential to ensuring that we are actually solving the right problems. What sort of threat actors should we worry about for adversarial attack you described in medical imaging? If I knew what my friend Michael meant by threat actors, I would answer that question, but uh, I will have to take that one offline. That's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of this year's Christmas lectures. <laughs>